Welcome, everybody. My name is Stephen Hansen. I'm the Director of Graduate Studies here at the Master's Program in Bioethics and Medical Humanities at Tulane. Um, and uh, I would like to welcome you all here today for our Williams Lecture, um, which once I share my screen, I will be able to... There we are. Be able to talk a little bit about. Um, today's lecture is on the Hippocratic Oath in the Medical Profession from Dr. Thomas Cavanaugh um, from uh, University of San Francisco College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I would be remiss uh, in, in my duties, though, if I did not uh, talk about the various people who have made this lecture possible. First and foremost, I think we have to talk about um, the Bioethics Interest Group who made the invitation to Dr. Kavanaugh, and we'll hear from them in a little bit. Um, but also quite important, the J.R. Williams Sr. Uh, MD 1931 Endowed Lecture Fund has made this possible as well. This was a fund initiated fairly recently, fall of 2013, um, to support lectures on spirituality and health at Tulane School of Medicine, focusing on the art of creating a compassionate and trusting relationship between patient and doctor. And this is a series that's made as a, 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 a to honor the legacy of one J. Richard Williams, senior uh, um, uh, MD, who was a Tulane University graduate and was a an internist and oncologist, well known and well loved in Selma, Alabama. The idea of this uh, series and the idea of this endowed fund is that Dr. Williams loved medicine and would do anything for his patient. But he had an interest in the impact of spirituality on health, particularly the positive impact of spirituality on the well-being and continued health of those who have suffered the loss of a loved one. And I, I, I really appreciate how much this focuses on the fact that healthcare is about our patients, but also the ones who love them. As co-sponsors, we also have uh, the master's program in bioethics and medical humanities. You can find out about us through tulane.edu slash bioethics. We're also on YouTube. And if you go search Tulane Bioethics on YouTube, you can find our, all of our previous Williams lectures, as well as a number of videos that we've put together talking about the program and some other things that are of interest that our programs put out. Uh, so lots of content there uh, as well. Let me tell you a little bit about the, the, the program. Not much. I will not take up much of your time. Again, that's why the, the link is there, tulane.edu slash bioethics. But we have two tracks. We are a program in bioethics and medical humanities, and all of our graduates get some bioethics and some medical humanities, but you can focus on one or the other. The bioethics track focuses on, again, as it makes sense, bioethics to direct people towards perhaps teaching research and service in hospital ethics committees, IRBs. Uh, teaching in healthcare settings of bioethics specifically, or uh, normative or empirical research in healthcare ethics. The medical humanities track certainly enables people to do some of those things, but it focuses on the connection between the humanities and the art and science of medicine. So we look at how medicine uh, is understood through narrative, reflective writing, literature, uh, film, fine arts, history, and so on, and how these things apply to healthcare and how we understand healthcare through them, and also how healthcare allows us to understand the, uh, them. We offer multiple different degrees. Our primary degree is the Master of Science, which can be earned in a two-year program or an accelerated one-year program. But it can also be earned part-time for people who, for example, are mid-career professionals coming back to learn more about this bioethics thing that sometimes they say, gosh, I wish I'd learned more about this during my training. Um, we also have, for people who are interested in it, a dual degree program, an MDMS program, which takes no extra time. So at the end of graduating from four years of medical school, you not only graduate with the MD, but also with an MS at the same time. And we're very excited to offer, uh, starting in the fall, three certificates, a graduate certificate in clinical ethics, research ethics, or medical humanities. These are 12-hour programs rather than the 33-hour program of the full Master of Science. And they give you a training and, an, a, and, and uh, a, a taste 
of one of the specific things, clinical ethics, research ethics, or medical humanities that you might focus on. And if that taste, of course, whets your appetite for the full master's program, you can apply the credits from the graduate certificates to the MS. Like I said, I don't want to take up any more of your time. So here is the link to lane.edu bioethics. Uh, if you have questions, a lot of information is there, but we're also willing to answer it ourselves. Uh, I am S. Hansen for at Tulane.edu, and Dr. Ofengenden is T. Ofengenden at Tulane.edu. Finally, I want to note that our next Williams lecture is coming up very soon, December 6th, uh, also at noon. Uh, and that's Dr. Virginia Bartlett from the Center for Healthcare Ethics at Cedar sinai on the ethics of what everyone knows, bringing forward the backstories in clinical encounters. But that's the future. Let's talk about the present. I would like to now hand things over to Nicholas Gerard to introduce our speaker. And I will stop my share in order to allow him to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Fantastic. Um, so my name is Nick Gerard, and I'm a second year medical student here at Tulane. And we're uh, actually hosting this. We're helping host this event. Uh, we're the bioethics interest group here. And um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kavanaugh. Dr. Kavanaugh teaches philosophy at the University of San Francisco, where he has been a member of the department since 1994. In 2018, Oxford University Press published his book entitled Hippocrates' Oath and Asclepius' Snake, The Birth of the Medical Profession, which arose from his teaching of medical ethics at USF. In 2006, the Clarendon Press of Oxford University published his book entitled Double Effect Reasoning, Doing Good and Avoiding Evil. This latter work addresses the medical ethics concerning end-of-life issues such as terminal sedation. He has delivered the Romanelle Lecture in SUNY Buffalo, the Lebrec Medical Ethics Lecture at Boston College, Carroll College's Annual Philosophy Lecture, Fresno City's Fresno City College's Annual Philosophy Lecture, and the University of Notre Dame's Philip and Doris Clark Lecture in Medical Ethics. For his work on the Hippocratic Oath, he has received the 2019 Smith Award for Lifetime Achievement in Medical Ethics. He continues to research and publish in medical ethics, action theory, the history of ethics, and medical ethics. Currently, he serves as the president of Philosophers in Jesuit Education. In 2020, he served as the president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association, and he earned his PhD from the University of Notre Dame and bachelor's from Thomas Aquinas College. So without further ado, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, can, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the screen. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. I'd like to first uh, thank uh, Nick and the Bioethics Interest Group and Drs. Ofengadin and Hansen and, and Dukas and the uh, program in medical ethics and human, human human values for for having me as your guest. I'm delighted to be with you, and um, yeah, just delighted to be here with you. I uh, let, just to tell you, my talk will be approximately 40 minutes, 45 minutes in length, so we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and uh, it it's relating. So the book is the Hippocrat Hippocrates' Oath and Asclepius' Snake. The birth of the medical profession. That's the, the cover of the book there. And um, what I'll be talking about today will be the, the role that Hippocrates, the very important, crucial role that Hippocrates plays in the conception of medicine as a profession. Uh, the, so the, that, that he's really at the birth of the notion of medicine as a profession. And we'll talk about what a profession is. And we'll I'll talk about the oath. Uh, and then I'll talk about the practice of solemn promising of oath taking uh, that that is so Hippocrates role in that in that practice is crucial. And of course, that uh, is something we do today as well. And so this is the idea of medicine as a profession. I just want to note just for kind of as a footnote and scholarly accuracy, when I speak of Hipp the oath as Hippocrates as his oath, we kind of have to take that with a grain of salt because we know that there, there was a person named Hippocrates historically. He lived probably around 470 BC to about 400 BC. He was born on the island of Kos 
which is in the Aegean Sea off the southeastern coast of contemporary Turkey. Uh, that's where he practiced medicine. That's where he learned medicine. His father was a physician. His family were physicians. He would have been taught by his father uh, to be a physician. We know that he taught others. We know, for example, and one of his crucial contributions was he opened up medical education to, to men, to males who were not the sons or relatives of physicians. That was really, that's probably why Hippocrates School is the most well-known school of Greek medicine that survives to this day. And we can trace back contemporary medicine to Hippocrates because prior to him, medical education was restricted to a, a male physician teaching a related, a blood relative, a male, the art of medicine. Hippocrates broke from that tradition. That was a big deal. And that's also why he probably had an oath and a contract uh, uh, to bind those individuals who were not his male relatives uh, to him as if they were his male relatives. So, uh, but when, when I speak of Hippocrates' oath, it's important to acknowledge that we don't, we don't know with 100% certitude that he wrote what we call the Hippocratic Oath. We don't, we know that he wrote things. We know that he had a school of medicine. We know that he taught people medicine, but we actually don't know with certitude what he wrote. Uh, we have a body of writings, but we always have to kind of, uh, when we attribute something to Hippocrates, you have to do it a little cautiously. So I just want to note that at the outset, um, uh, I, it's likely that he wrote the oath, but it could be that he didn't. Um, it, regardless, the oath is important in the history of medicine, and oath-taking is important in the history of medicine. Um, I do want to note uh, that at the beginning of my presentation that concerning this presentation, I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, so let's let's think a little bit about our current practice. This is a, a photograph of a white coat ceremony. Um, I know that's a ceremony with which you're intimately familiar. I know that Tulane has such a ceremony. And, um, and since 1993 in the United States, it's very common now to have white coat ceremonies at which matriculating uh, students of medical medicine take an oath, an oath that oath might vary, but they will take an oath. And uh, this is a, a photograph of a white coat ceremony. And um, this taking of an oath, this professing, right, goes back to Hippocrates uh, and to the Hippocratic Oath. It probably goes back even further than that, but, but that's the uh, historical origin of which we are aware. Um, and professing, right, we, as these students are doing, we stand in front of others and we tell them that for which we stand. What are we going to do? What are we not going to do? Professing is a Latin word. Uh, pro means in front of. Uh, fessio comes from the Latin fatere to speak. So when we, when we make a profession, literally, we, uh, this is where the word profession comes from. We stand in front of other people and we tell them, this is what I stand for. I'm going to do this and I'm not going to do this, right? I'm, these are the things I'm going to do. These are the things I'm not going to do. I'm a member of a profession. Um, and that practice of professing and this concept of medicine as a involving a profession, a promising, uh, goes back to Hippocrates, which is why thinking about the Hippocratic Oath is, is relevant to our own circumstances. Um, I note that, yeah, Columbia University Medical School in 1993, they revived the practice and uh, it has spread widely now. I think it'd be fair to say that uh, almost, if not every, almost every medical school in the United States of America uh, has the practice of a white coat ceremony, has the practice of medical oath taking, medical promising. Um, now, and, and there you go. Uh, this is a, um, this is the uh, oath that was taken at um, Tulane Medical School for the class of 2025. It's, uh, won't go into all the particulars of the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. The oath has an element of a contract as well as an oath uh, in it. And, uh, but 
that begins very similarly. Here we have the Tulane students solemnly swearing before all that is holy and sacred, right? Um, in the Hippocratic Oath, the, the juror, the person who took the oath, swore to all the gods and goddesses. That was, it's actually one of the few <laughs> that includes this, uh, all of the gods and goddesses reflecting how, how solemn that particular oath was. Um, the Tulane Oath speaks about teachers and respect and gratitude towards teachers. The Hippocratic Oath actually involves a contract where the student really, because the, the teacher may not be a blood relative, the student really is committed to the teacher as if the teacher were a blood relative, will take care of the teacher in the teacher's old age and things like that. Um, and then of course, one of the things to, to note here, and this oath, the Tulane oath clearly has been influenced by the Hippocratic oath, but um, in the one passage there in particular, um, I, will, I will remember the physicians', physicians duties to prevent and treat and heal the sick, but above, above all, prevent suffering and do no harm. Do no harm uh, is, is a principle that looms large in the Hippocratic Oath. It, this phrase, do no harm, is actually found in uh, another writing of, of Hippocrates called the Epidemics, where he says, as to diseases, practice to help or at least do no harm. And that do no harm is kind of primum non notre is the Latin for that. That kind of has taken on a life of its own in medicine as like, this is a basic principle. But uh, certainly Hippocrates was particularly concerned about physicians avoiding harm to patients uh, because he realized that medicine is, is a can be dangerous. And he was, there were particular dangers he was particularly concerned about. Um, but uh, let's go on here and, and look about, uh, think a little bit more about profession. This is a the title page to a work by a fellow named Scribonius Largus, who was a, a physician in uh, classical Rome. So he lived around 50 AD. He wrote Compositiones is really uh, it's a book about uh, medicines, but in that book, um, uh, Scribonius writes, and just to read uh, what he has to, to say, it's one of the first historical references to the Hippocratic Oath. He writes that Hippocrates, and Scribonius wrote in Latin, so he said, the founder of our profession, which the word in Latin is profess, professio, um, handed on to our discipline an oath right? And thus, he says, he greatly prepared the minds of his disciples for humanity. Um, the conservation of the name and honor of medicine with a holy and devoted heart has been greatly valued by everyone who has acted according to Hippocrates' credo. And then he quotes what he understands that credo to be. For medicine is a science of healing, not of harming, right? We're, we're going to help not harm. And we have here, th this is actually in the etymology of the word profession. Uh, one of the first uses of that word uh, is found in its reference to medicine as a profession. So actually, if you, if you look at the history of the, the idea of a profession, at the very beginning of the idea of a profession in the West, it's a Latin word, so we're talking about the, the Romans, not the Greeks, but... Um, we find that medicine is, is amongst the, well, actually the very first profession that is spoken of as a profession. Uh, so it's paradigmatic, this promising that can be traced back to Hippocrates. Now, let's, let, I'm going to uh, talk about the oath, now the Hippocratic oath, and what kind of motivated Hippocrates to have this oath, but I want to do that by means of the medical symbol, right? So if we look at this, this is a statue of Asclepius, and here we have a stick, right? And we have a snake wrapped around the stick. Here also, we have another example of that. Asclepius was the Greek demigod of medicine. He's one of the gods to whom the person who took the oath would have sworn to Asclepius. Here we have, again, a stick with a snake wrapped around it. Now, if we were in um, a Zoom session and uh, I asked you to go into little breakout rooms and uh, come up with a symbol for medicine, 
and I, um, you were in groups of five or six or whatever. And one of your fellow uh, classmates or attendees said, well, I'd, I think we should have a snake as a symbol of medicine. I'm pretty sure that that, um, that suggestion would not get, get many much uh, grip on your group, right? I don't, think, I don't think that if you were asked to come up with a symbol of medicine, that the idea of a snake being a symbol of medicine would actually get much, um, much in engagement from your fellow fellows who were given that task. And yet, there it is. There, that is the symbol of medicine. I'm sure today, if you're at a medical school or if you're in a medical office, you'll probably see us uh, that symbol today. You'll see it somewhere. You'll see it on drugs. You'll see it on a building. You'll see it on someone's card or something. Uh, so, but it's very curious. Why is a snake affiliated with medicine? And that's uh, what my suggestion is. The snake is affiliated with medicine in part because snakes wound, and the ancient Greeks were aware of this idea that wounding and healing are intimately related, and, there, and Hippocrates was, concern, was concerned about healers wounding, uh, and I'll tell a story I hope that illustrates that, but uh, why is there a walking stick first? Maybe we could talk about that's a little uh, easier to get at. The reason there's a walking stick, and this is a walking stick, is because ancient Greek physicians were what, what they would have called themselves epidemiological. Uh, that word means literally they went epi around the deme from one village, deme means village, to another. They walked, they were itinerant, they would go from one village to another. And that's why they had a walking stick to symbolize uh, the physician. That's why that's what we're looking at, a walking stick. But of course, we have the question, why do we have a snake, though? Why do we have a snake? Um, now, one take home uh, for you today is, is uh, if, you, if someone asks, well, what did you learn today? One of the things hopefully you learned today is that the symbol of medicine is one snake, not two snakes. One snake, not two. This before you, this is called the caduceus. This is actually the wand of Hermes or Mercury, who is the messenger of the gods. This particular symbol uh, in the 1700s occurred. It was found on medical textbooks in the United States, um, and it was confused with the symbol of medicine. People were aware, well, the symbol of medicine has a snake, some snakes associated with it. Um, but the reason it was confused with the symbol of medicine was because publishers use this symbol as a symbol of their profession of spreading a message, educating people. And they put it on all their textbooks. But when it was on, found on medical textbooks, especially in the United States, people thought, oh, that's the medical symbol. Actually, it wasn't the medical symbol. It's the symbol of Hermes or Mercury. But it, even to this day, you'll find this symbol on all sorts of medical literature, uh, ambulances. Um, you'll find it, uh, for example, the U.S. Army Medical Corps still uses this as their symbol. This is not the historically accurate symbol of medicine. So there's a little bonus, if you will, a little medical trivia uh, you can walk away with today that, that uh, this, the medical symbol, right, is one snake around uh, uh, a walking stick, not two. Okay, but why is there a snake? Uh, why have a snake at all? Well, let's let's think of a couple reasons that medical historians offer, and I'm going to focus on the role of the snake as a wounder. But before we go to that, um, there are certain phenomena. Snakes, for example, if you've ever seen a snake uh, uh, skin, if you've gone out for a hike or anything like that, and you've come across a snake skin, a snake who's molted, right? You'll find that inverted sock the the uh the skin of the snake in, in its entirety sometimes you'll encounter it on a, a path and um of course that suggests when snakes molt maybe they could kind of heal themselves perhaps they would be a source of healing they've shedded their skin they have new grown new skin so perhaps that's one reason why they become affiliated with uh, as a symbol of medicine another reason is uh that historians medical historians fasten upon is that snakes are chthonic. That's a Greek word, meaning they're always associated with the earth. Uh, so they would know the earth. They would know its healing properties, perhaps. They would know 
uh, medicines. And so that is another reason why perhaps they become affiliated with medicine as a symbol of medicine. Another reason, which is kind of interesting, curious reason some uh, medical historians have proposed is uh, an actual disease, uh, Dracunculus medinensis, which means the little dragons of Medina. Medina is a city in the Arabian Peninsula where this disease, which is also called guinea worm disease, a uh, guinea worm is a parasite, um, is indigenous to that area. And uh, what happens is, as you can see on the left of the slide there, the uh, victim ingests content water that's been contaminated with the guinea worm larvae. The larvae hatch in the, uh, in the uh, digestive system of the victim. And then the parasite, the worm, will go to the extremities and exit, usually in the, in the, in the legs or the feet. Um, and you can see that there on the right hand side that's happening. Now, uh, we, we now we have drugs to treat guinea worm disease, but even to this day, people will, will try to um, get the worm out with a little stick. You can see there on the left side, they'll, they'll get the worm to wrap itself around a stick uh, in the hopes of, 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 of removing it from the victim's body. Um, and medical historians suggest, well, perhaps in the Arabian Peninsula, right, um, right across from Greece there, you have perhaps medical practitioners symbolize their, their practice by having a little uh, a stick with a little worm wrapped around it. And that perhaps became kind of a symbol of medicine. Um, as the Italians say, se non è vero e bene trovato, that is, if it's not true, at least makes for a good story. Um, that I'm not sure what to make of it, but I think it, it sounds like a good story. But uh, I'm inclined to think that the, uh, the the snake is a symbol of medicine for, for numerous reasons, but amongst which is the very fact that the snake is a wounder, is a wounder. And this brings me to what I call the homeopathic principle. Um, and this is something that Hippocrates will be concerned about. Okay, so Homeopathy, of course, like so many um, words uh, in medicine, it's a Greek word. Homeo means similar and pathos means disease. So homeopathic remedies are remedies that are similar. They're somehow cause something similar uh, to the disease, right? So they're, they're, they're similar to the disease, right? Homeopathic. And the Greeks were aware of the principle of homeopathy, right? cure like with like. So if someone's hot, give them something hot. If someone's cold, give them someone cold. This, this idea of like cures like. Um, they were aware of that. They spoke about it, the, the, the homeopathic approach to healing. And one, uh, of course, more uh, uh, example of homeopathy with which we're much more familiar would be the idea of vaccination, right? So this little um, image and this painting in front of you, is illustrating Jenner's right um, use of vaccination. She came up with the word vaccination. Vaca is a Latin word for cow. And what he realized was that, and other people did as well, but he probably was the first really to publish about it, really is why he's associated with vaccination. And he came up with the name vaccination. Um, he was a physician in the, in the early 1700s, mid 1700s. Um, he, Realize that um, milkmaids, right? So here we have a milkmaid. A milkmaids would get cowpox, uh, which was a mild disease, and cowpox conferred immunity to smallpox, which was a virulent, dangerous, lethal disease. So Jenner uh, inoculated people with cowpox in the hope of conferring immunity to smallpox, which in fact it did, and 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 he was successful in that in that enterprise. Um, and that's an instance of homeopathy, homeopathy where like cures like, right? And the Greeks, not necessarily aware of vaccination, but they were certainly aware of this principle as a medical principle. Now, if for the Greeks, the way they uh, spoke about homeopathy, they had a little uh, pithy saying. And the pithy saying was, the wounder heals. You can see that's homeopathic, right? Wounder heals. The thing that causes disease will heal disease, right? So, uh, and that was a saying in their culture, the actual 
wound or heals was a saying, a very famous saying in their culture. The ancient Greeks loved paradox. They were in love with paradox. So they had numerous sayings like a moderation in all things, right? So always be moderate in everything, right? Uh, kind of paradoxical. Um, know thyself, right? How would you not be capable of knowing yourself? But it's presenting oneself as a mystery to oneself. Um, and this particular, this particular aphorism, the wounder heals, was one of which they were enamored, right? Enamored. And it was one of which certainly Hippocrates is very aware of and concerned about. Um, and it was associated with, just to uh, uh, ground it in a story, it was the, the wounder heals is a phrase that um, is found in a Greek tragedy called Telephus. Like uh, you're probably familiar with Oedipus Rex or Antigone. Telephus is a Greek tragedy which was uh, written each of the three great Greek, ancient Greek tragedians, uh, Euripides, Aeschylus, and Sophocles, each of them separately had written uh, of this story, the story of Telephus. And what we're witnessing here in this sculpture before us here, this is an illustration of the central event of that story. What we have here is Achilles, this is Achilles here, healing Telephus, right? So this is a sculpture that was found in Herculaneum. It was buried uh, in 79 AD under volcanic ash when Vesuvius erupted, but it's now in the um, Naples in the archaeological museum there. And uh, what we have here is Achilles is scraping filings from his uh, spear into the abdomen of Telephus. And um, this is illustrating this pithy saying, this idea that the Greeks had of the wound or healing, uh, which is a phrase that's found in each of those, tra the tragedy Telephus written by uh, Sophocles and uh, Euripides and Aeschylus. What, what happened? Well, what happened was when, um, when Achilles first went to Troy, to sack Troy, which is the story that... Uh, that Homer tells us in the Iliad, right? That great epic poem of Greek literature. Um, Achilles went to the wrong city. He attacked Telephus's city first and Telephus was wounded. Telephus successfully defended his city against Achilles attack, but Telephus was wounded and Telephus's wound would not heal. Uh, and actually even to this day, wounds that will not heal are often are sometimes called Telephian in reference to this fact about Telephus. So Telephus, being a good Greek, he went to the, the oracle at Delphi. The oracle at Delphi was a temple where the priestess, who was devoted to Apollo, the god of healing and of uh, sickening, and one of the gods to whom the, the, the juror who took the Hippocratic oath would have sworn to Apollo, healer, uh, and, and went to, to that oracle and asked her, how am I going to be healed? And she said, the wounder heals, the wounder heals. This is how that aphorism enters into Greek culture. Now, uh, Telephus then is like, well, he goes to Achilles, right? And he says, you're, you're going to have to heal me. And this is what happens is Achilles takes his spear and with that spear, he he fought, he scrapes off little filings from the spear into Telephus's abdomen, into his wound, and Telephus is healed. Right now, just as a kind of a footnote, it's kind of interesting from a, a medical standpoint. There, there, this actually may have may this uh, using metal filing metal filings to heal a wound could actually be efficacious uh, because those metals right lead, um, uh, zinc, other metals have antimicrobial properties. So that's kind of an interesting footnote uh, to this story. Um, it may actually have been a practice, right, to put fi medical filings into wounds and may have been efficacious if they had a microbial infection. But regardless, the story of, is illustrating this principle that the, the wounder heals, okay, the homeopathic principle. And of course, 
in light of that, it would make sense that a wounder, right, a snake, would be the symbol of medicine. The wounder heals. That would be appealing to the ancient Greeks who were so in love with uh, paradox. Now, um, you might think that's kind of curious. The ancient Greeks had a snake affiliated with healing, but also we find it in, interestingly, um, and I've, I've never found any connection between the two. It looks as if these are independent. They might be, they might be uh, somehow connected historically, but to my knowledge, I've, I've not read any evidence to that effect. Uh, but interestingly, in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Hebrew tradition, a snake is, a, even though the snake is, of course, associated with wounding from the story of Genesis, where the, the snake, right, wounds humanity uh, in the Garden of Eden, the snake is in the in the book of Numbers, right? It becomes a symbol of healing. Let me just read a little bit from the book of Numbers in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Uh, this is from the book of Numbers. Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt uh, and to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So there again, you find this serpent, right, um, as a symbol, actually, a, effica a cause of healing, right? So very, in the Hebrew tradition, very distinct from the Greeks, but there again, we find a snake associated with healing, a symbol of healing, a snake on a staff. Um, in any case, for our purposes, uh, the, 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 what's of great concern to Hippocrates Given that the wounder heals, that's what I call the homeopathic principle, right, is the iatrogenic principle, the healer wounds, right? And that, and that those two principles are kind of mirror images of one another. They're, they're isomorphs of one another. They're like hands that kind of complement each other. Um, the homeopathic principle and the iatrogenic principle. Of course, iatrogenic, like so many words, is a Greek word. Of, so many medical words is a Greek word. Iatros is the Greek word for physician. And genos is the word for cause, right? So an iatro, as you know, an iatrogenic, uh, iatrogenic uh, disease is a disease that's been caused by a physician or a wound that's been caused by a physician. And so the healer wounds, right? The healer wounds, just as the wounder heals, so also the healer wounds. And this was, this is, um, of great concern to Hippocrates, right? First, do no harm. As to diseases, practice to help, or at least do no harm. And we find that in the oath, right? He's very, he says, regimens I will use for the benefit of the sick, but what, uh, according to my ability and judgment, but what uh, is harmful and unjust, I will keep away from the sick. And then he says, a deadly drug I will not give even if I am asked, nor will I suggest this, right? So uh, harms loom large in his mind as something we've got to avoid because we know that the healer, just as the wounder heals, so also the healer wounds. Now, just to think a little bit about some of the wounds associated with medicine and the ones in particular that Hippocrates was concerned about, we could think of what I what I call wounds of therapy. So wounds of therapy are are unavoidable even in excellent medicine, right? Uh, that the wounds of therapy just simply come about because uh, whenever there's a medical intervention, right? You it's kind of the friction associated with treatment. You're going to have to cut, cauterize, give a drug which always has uh, deleterious side effects to the patient in order to address the sickness. So you're, you're going to caught wound in the, in even in excellent caregiving, right? You can make these wounds smaller, you can make them less painful, but um, this will hurt, right? That phrase, 
will probably will never be eliminated from the practice of medicine, right? You're going, we're always going to have to say, well, this is going to hurt uh, because of that intervention and that that hurt associated with even very good and sound and appropriate interventions is what I call a wound of therapy. Um, so clearly uh, you want to limit those, but you can't get rid of them. Um, other other uh, kinds of uh, uh, harms that are associated with the practice of medicine would be errors, right? So errors, here we have an example of a drug medication error. This drug is used to treat tuberculosis. Uh, you can see how uh, uh, a physician or a practitioner could easily be set up to commit an error with this kind of bottling, which of course pharmaceutical companies diligently try to avoid. But this, this example um, is an actual historical example of a medical error where the, the uh, bottle on the left contains right 30 capsules of 150 milligrams of the drug, the bottle on the right, 30 capsules of 300 uh, milligrams of the same drug. Uh, of course, you could see any, any of us, any person, <laughs> normal person would easily confuse these two, even though the one is uh, dose, in a 300 milligram, of course, twice as much. My understanding is that um, when this drug has been given in, in inappropriate doses, uh, it, ca it causes like um, the patient to turn bright red, you know, for example. So fortunately it isn't that harmful, but you can definitely see how errors occur. Now errors, right, are avoidable and therefore they're not really wounds of therapy, but they are, the we kind of learn what errors we we make, right? This would be an example where a person learns, oh, we need to change the, the bottling of this medication because we realize that's confusing. Um, so uh, certainly Hippocrates is trying to avoid errors in practice of medicine. But what he's particularly concerned about is what I call role conflation, right? And this is where the healer would actually set out to wound, set out to wound. This is where the healer says, no, I'm going to, and just to use the example from the Hippocratic Oath, right? I'm going to give a deadly drug, right? Uh, Hippocrates say, no, we can't. We're not going to get involved in giving deadly drugs, nor are we going to suggest that we're going to give deadly drugs. That's not what our role is. That's to confuse the role of the healer with the role of the wounder, to adopt the role of wounder. We're not going to do that. Uh, that's the principle uh, that's his most prominent concern. Do not deliberately, intentionally adopt the role of wounder. Physicians should not do that. Um, and uh, he, he again, th this is a quote from the um, from the epidemics uh, in the Greek. Uh, what we have here is where he says, uh, as to diseases, uh, no no se mata. That's the Greek word for disease. Duo practice to askine is the word meaning really to develop finesse right so and really practice that is that's he's really thinking about practice making perfect uh and that's what that word connotes so he's saying become adept uh, as as it concerns diseases come become adept concerning two things help or at least don't harm do not harm um one of the great uh, fans, if you will, of, in the history of medicine, of um, of Hippocrates is the ancient, uh, the classical Roman physician Galen, who uh, wrote extensively on Hippocrates. And Galen was uh, the he was a Roman physician in classical Rome. He was a, a physician to the gladiators as well as to the emperor Marcus Aurelius in uh, Rome. And he lived from about 129 to about 210 AD. But he asked to this statement from the epidemics, and this statement of Hippocrates, do no harm, is from the epidemics. Um, Galen said, you know, here, here's what he says. For those who learn the art, I know that, as it was for me, the maxim, be useful or do no harm. This is what he's, this one I mentioned to you know, from uh, epidemics seems not to be worthy to have been written by Hippocrates. Galen's saying it's so simple, why would he even mention it? But then he goes on, but for those who subsequently practice medicine, I know very well that the force of the phrase will be clear. 
um, that is Galen tells us that when he first read that, he thought that's beneath Hippocrates to even mention, you know, do no harm. But uh, Galen said, no, actually, this is crucial for physicians. We've got to really have this in the forefront of our minds as we practice medicine. And just to think of one historical example, uh, that the guillotine, right, I don't, I don't, just to remind people that the guillotine, right, that method of capital punishment was actually developed by a physician, guillotine. It's named after a physician, guillotine. And uh, guillotine and his colleague, Luis, who was a physician also, they, they came up with the idea and per, tried to perfect it and of this way of killing, right? That, that And it's certainly a dramatic departure from the role of the healer, right? Adopting, deliberately adopting the role of the wounder. And Hippocrates also, of course, mentions not gossiping, right, about patients uh, and um, avoiding sexual predation, right? Those are, those are two other uh, instances where he said, we're not going to kill, we're not going to uh, gossip, and we're not going to uh, sexually predate uh, in our practice of medicine. Those are salient harms that he said those have to be out of bounds. Now, um, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of coming towards the latter part of my talk, but I want to um, put the Hippocratic Oath a little bit to the side and talk about just the practice of promising. Why does it make sense for physicians to promise? Why does it make sense for physicians to take a solemn promise? Why does it make sense to have the white coat ceremony? I mean, is it just simply a gesture to this past uh, history that we find with Hippocrates? And I don't think it is. I think, in fact, Hippocrates had great reasons for having the oath taken, and we do as well. And uh, I just want to reflect on some of those reasons of having um, having medical oath taking, not just because the word profession refers to the taking of oath, that's a historical etymological reason, but what substantive reasons could we give? And I think uh, if we look at what 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 practices do we uh, make promise, solemn promises concerning, we'll see that they are weighty substantive practices like getting married, where we're going to start a family, right? New, the transmitting new life to the next generation. We take solemn promises, matrimonial vows, or concerning the law, justice. We take matrimonial, we take vows of office concerning enforcement of the law. Justice is an important uh, phenomenon, an important good that we have to protect with taking of a vow, right? Um, and similarly, uh, religious vows, right? People who go into religious life take vows. So also medicine deals with matters of great significance, deals with our, with life and with death, deals with our mortality, deals with our being subject to wounds, to vulnerability. And so it makes sense that the practitioners of that uh, practice would take a solemn vow because it's a serious matter with which they deal. Um, so there's a reason for having medical promising there. Also, um, not only you could say that, well, medicine deals with things that are not frivolous, right? It deals with substantive matters, but also the taking of a solemn vow is indicates that we're undertaking this practice in a serious manner. We're doing it deliberately. We're not doing it ca in a cavalier matter or manner or in a frivolous manner. That is, we're doing it deliberately. We're taking a vow as we embark upon this practice of, of medicine, which is a weighty and substantive thing to involve oneself in. Um, also, another reason for medicine having, um, uh, uh, just want to watch the clock a little bit here. Yeah, I think we're, okay, yeah, we're doing okay. Medicine having vows. Uh, students of promising note that making a promise actually helps us to do what we promise to do, interestingly. That is, as, actually, may, may, having made a promise motivates us to keep the promise. And so given medicine is a hard, is a difficult uh, practice to do well, right? Making a promise makes sense because making the promise might actually help us, help those who make the promise, do this difficult task of being a physician. 
Um, it also focuses our deliberation, tells us what to think about, right? So Hippocrates says, regimens I will use for the benefit of the sick. Uh, so he's not going to think about, he's thinking about the, the physical welfare of his patient, the organic welfare of his patient, not thinking about the financial welfare of his patient or anything like that. Those are, those are not his primary concerns. It focuses deliberation. It also, uh, and I want to leave some time for questions, so I'll, I'll uh, read coming, approaching a conclusion, but also gives us the path upon which we're going to excel, right? Go out ahead along this path that is defined by what I'll do and what I won't do. Um, it also explains our, our conduct, right? And if it's a good promise, it actually justifies our conduct. So uh, in the Tulane uh, School of Medicine, the juror promises to hold secret and close what has been revealed to uh, the, the juror, to the one who takes the oath, right? So if you ask, well, why aren't you willing to disclose this information about your patient? Well, because I, I took an oath that explains why I'm not going to disclose it. And since it's a good uh, oath, a good promise. It also justifies that. Um, and then importantly, it, it confers, it's an act of autonomy, right? So autonomy is a Greek word. We often uh, self-autos, self-nomos, ruled, self-governed. Um, we often speak of patient autonomy, which is perfectly appropriate, but there's also professional autonomy, right? Where the professionals, the profession, the person who's undertaking this practice obligates herself, right, by her promises, the law that she gives herself, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm not going to do. So we have professional autonomy, which is a very important concept, uh, and, and that uh, we need to, right, uh, if we look here at our physician on the left, as it were, in society and law and, and maybe a health management organization on the right, we need to respect that, that professional autonomy that is conferred upon the professional in part by the taking of the oath, the commitment. Um, so let me, um, cause I see, I, I wanna leave time for questions and answers. So let me just conclude uh, my talk with um, the, the Tulane oath, uh, oath and note that um, may, I hope that uh, those of you who have taken it will keep the oath faithfully and that you will enjoy as the last uh, sentence of the oath indicates your practice of your art. And so I wanna thank you for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing and open us because I do wanna have time for questions. And I uh, thank you so much for your attention and uh, for the opportunity to be here with you today. And I, sorry, I see we've got a few, few I wish I had left a few more minutes for, uh, uh, questions, but uh, we do have some time. Dr. Cavanaugh, thank you again for your talk. Um, we do have a question here from uh, someone here in the classroom. Sorry, Excellent. I'm uh, Kent Van Donge, a medical student here. Um, I had a quick question. You talked about like uh, homeopathy or homeopathy. Um, could the do no harm part of Hippocratic Oath be kind of his um, kind of refusal to homeopathy be like kind of his way of saying that uh wounder sh or healer shouldn't wound the homeopathy isn't the best practice of medicine has that ever come up in any literature well i, I mean hippocrates uh apparent they embraced was willing to use cures that were like the disease so he he certainly wouldn't have been aware of something like vaccination but um but he was certainly aware of the fact that even excellent medicine involves harm, some uh, injuring, if you will, or some wounding, if you could speak of it that way. That's why I talk about those therapeutic wounds. He's certainly, and that was because he was so aware of it, right? He was like, look, medicine is a dangerous intervention. It's always fraught with uh, danger. So let us be aware of that. As we attempt to help, let us always be aware that we do not want to harm. And what we and we definitely don't want to intentionally harm deliberately. We don't want to adopt the role of wounder. I don't think he would think that homeopathy, the way I'm using that, necessarily adopts 
the role of wounder. I mean, if you think of like a vaccination inoculation as an example, um, you are in some sense, you are spreading a disease, right? <laughs> but you're not doing it with the intention of causing disease, right? You're doing it with the intention of preventing a, a, a more harmful disease. And of course, we find that all the time with uh, vaccinations that, right, people get fevers and all sorts of things happen, uh, but that's not the point of that intervention. Does that, does that get at your question? Um, yes, it, it does. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if there were, were there any um, in the chat. Were there questions or or I'm well, not sure. Yes. About well, yes, actually, uh, uh, I put a question uh, in the chat, uh, but maybe they didn't see it. Okay, so my question was: Did um, um, uh, the great philosopher and and the uh, and the uh, and the doctor did he mention uh, uh, anything about prognostication should and how the physician prognosticate? Uh, there's a famous statement in um, in in the aphorisms uh, associated with Hippocrates about prognostication and the difficulty of it, right? The great difficulty of it, that he just, he just uh, described it as of, of great difficulty, uh, that, um, that he, he not, not necessarily counseling against it, but just acknowledging that it's a perilous pro exercise, right? Uh, to try to prognosticate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I have a question. Um, and this comes to, in terms of the, the act of harming to with the intention of, a, of hopefully a better outcome and this whole risk benefit um, calculus that um, Hippocrates discusses. As part of the classic oath, though, he does actually <clears throat> state some opposition to surgery um, in, in itself in terms uh, of uh, taking a knife uh, that because there was a difference in terms of uh, the healing profession versus in that sense of the act that uh, what surgeons do. Um, and I w wanted to kind of just clarify in terms of that context of of what was classic Hippocrates and what we do now, um, so to speak, um, in terms of our interpretation of his work. Yes. Yeah, that's a very famous passage in the oath. I will not cut, um, not even for stone, uh, uh, pr presumably referring to kidney stone, but I will defer to those who practice this art. Um, that that's probably the most difficult passage in the oath uh, to uh, interpret, uh, and also the one that there's the greatest debate over. Um, <laughs> my own and and uh, my own sense is that so surgery uh, was um, definitely part of Hippocratic medicine and part of Greek medicine, and so. Um, in, in fact, in Greek mythology, Chiron, which which his name means hand, uh, is the one who taught the uh, Asclepius medicine. So Chiron was a surgeon. Chiron is the person, the, the individual who taught the Greeks medicine. So to see that surgery is ruled out uh, is very jarring. And um, and uh, the the interpretation I favor is that 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 is is an old that is something that's been put into the oath by someone years down the road, and it looks even if uh, the, in the Greek it looks like it's a little bit 
different uh, dialect uh, from, from the, the rest of the text. However, that is, you're absolutely correct uh, that that is in the oath um, and uh, in the best manuscripts that we have, it's found in the oath, although it's very, very difficult to reconcile with, with what we have confidently know about Greek and Hippocratic medicine, that the ancient Greeks did uh, practice surgery. So what's going on there is very, very difficult to interpret. And I, I, uh, my, uh, I'm not entirely satisfied with the answer that I've given, but I think it's the best one that I've come across yet, which is this idea that, uh, which some scholars uh, agree with me on that, that it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a later, it's a later uh, interpolation in the text. Someone's introduced that into the text. Yeah, I was always curious of that piece of the, because until really the 17, 1800s, there was also the medieval barber surgeons versus the physicians who are more from, a, a, you know, a, more a clergy type uh, um, level um, mm -hmm. rather than um, a guild level. And so I was curious if that had any um, standing in the Greek society as well, in terms of the distinction of surgeons and and if we other practitioners. At, yeah, no, no, no. It, it, even in the uh, Iliad, in the Homer's Iliad, we have a surgeon, right? So we have two physicians, one of whom is a surgeon. Um, so, and there's no uh, no apparent uh, um, dr dramatic uh, division between them. And again, Chiron is this mythological figure. Ch Chiron is the Greek word from which we actually get our word surgeon. Surgeon uh, is, it means using one's hands. And that's where Chiron, Chir, right, is the Greek word for hand. So chirurgeon, chirurgeon is where we get our word for surgeon in English, actually, etymologically. Um, and so, yes, sur surgeons are at the very, at the very epicenter of Greek medicine. There's a, an important question that was asked in the chat that uh, uh, I think several of us would like your take on. Uh, the question goes, it's from uh, Laura Madigan McCown. Those who practice physician-assisted suicide claim to be helping their patients through hastening death. How does this square with do no harm? Well, I'm inclined. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan of the Hippocratic Oath. So, um, you know, obviously, I've written a book on the oath, and I'm very sympathetic to Hippocrates, um, to his. I will not give a deadly drug, nor will I suggest this, uh, this counsel. Um, so, I, I, I do think that that's. Um, I don't regard it as therapeutic. I know that people do, certainly. I think they do that sincerely, believe that. But I might, I just, I don't think it's a therapeutic act. And I think it's a boundary for physicians um, that, that uh, giving deadly drugs is a boundary for physicians. And I, the example of guillotine, I think, is illustrative. Of course, uh, people involved in physicians as suicide don't don't conceive of themselves as maybe in the same company as guillotine. But I think it's a difficult argument to make because guillotine getting involved in capital punishment makes a lot of sense um, for a physician. In some, I think it's wrong, of course, but but it does make a lot of sense because who better? And this is what motivated guillotine, right? He was like, well, look. I, I can kill people much more humanely than the than the executioner. So let me do this. Let me do this. I'll show you how it's done and I'll show you how to do it well. And of course his method is uh, better than what was available for the condemned at the time that he was uh, he offered it. But I think again that 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 was a boundary that he crossed that that it, physicians should not cross. That's a boundary in the therapeutic practice of medicine where physicians are committed only to therapeutic acts. And I don't think killing is a therapeutic act because the subject has to, uh, has to be present 
to be the beneficiary of the therapeutic act. If the, if the act uh, destroys the subject, it, it can't be considered therapeutic because the subject is not there to receive the benefit. Um, so I think killing is just not therapeutic. Yeah, I have a question uh, about the etymology of Hippocrates, his name. His name. Mm -hmm. Yes, because that basically means horsepower. Horse? And horsepower. Yes. And Chiron himself uh, was a centaur. And uh, it occurred to me uh, that the family name of Hippocrates may be a reference uh, to being taught by a horse, namely the centaur. Uh, not directly, but uh, his lineage. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the name Hippocrates, it, 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 uh, yeah, the Greeks loved horses. They were a horse, horse people. And uh, so Hippos, a uh, horse, and Crates would be like a good horse man or good judge of horses, a competent horse rider. So the name Hippocrates would be a name that was very common amongst the ancient Greeks. It, it, it's, um, it's a name that, um, uh, like Philip is our example, maybe uh, probably even more common than our use of the word Philip. But Philip, of course, is a Greek word meaning lover of horses, right? Um, it's curious, I don't know the, yeah, the connection to the centaur, but that's an interesting connection to make. But certainly um, at the time that Hippocrates had that, that name, Hippocrates, uh it it would have been uh a common a common name for a, a a greek to have a lover of horses or a good horseman um and and um yeah that that's that's the source of that name i think for him personally but he be, he began he belonged to the asclepiads which is a clan so he'd be Hippocrates the Asclepiad and from the island of Kos. So, so uh, and that clan, of course, was the clan, one of the clans that um, taught its members medicine. And again, the, the crucial contribution he makes is he opens up medical education to males who are not related to him. And that's probably why his school survived, whereas other schools of which he was aware, passed out of existence. There was a school on the island of Canitis, which passed out a medical school, uh, which passed out of existence because there weren't enough uh, students to pass on the tradition, to whom one would pass on the tradition. And so, uh, Hippocrates was aware of this. And so he opened up the practice of medicine to males who were not related to him. And that's probably why we have his writings and. We know about him because uh, his tradition survived, whereas others passed out of existence. Um, unfortunately, we will have to end the session now because okay. it's late um, and we have another meeting. So I would like to thank you very, very much to Dr. Kavad. Okay. Sorry, Kavana and Nick for organizing it. And if you have more questions, you're welcome to write to me. And if you're willing to give your email, we can provide that. To oh, you. I'd be delighted to. Absolutely. Yes, certainly. Please. Thank Please. you very, very much, sir. Thanks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.